How many of you feel like you're in his arms tonight? Yeah. Amen. No matter how you felt coming in, the Lord loves us unconditionally. The moment we open our arms to him, he receives us into his arms. He washes us clean. He's just a good God. And we've been so blessed the last few weeks learning about our identity. It's so important to get your identity. You cannot walk in your authority unless you know your identity. And God wants us to walk in his authority. He created man to walk in dominion. And to have rules on the earth. To put things in proper order. To bring heaven to earth. So it's vital to see God's will done on earth, we must know our identity. And so um, Joel is going to be teaching part three tonight. We will then take a break for a week. And um, next week we'll have a guest speaker. He's not a total guest because he's been here before. His name is Matt Burris. He's a minister in a prophetic evangelism gifting. And uh, he'll be here with us. Excellent. Awesome dude. Very like dude kind of guy. <laughs> it's a fun guy, so that'll be next week, and then Joel will start right back. Three more lessons, March, in the second, third, and fourth week of March. So let's just welcome Joel yeah. G. Yeah. Hallelujah, praise God. It's such a blessing to be here today to share with you yet another um, Wednesday, I know that God is going to do something great. Amen. So let's just um, pray and um, get right into it Amen. as the Holy Spirit give us wisdom and utterance. Heavenly Father, we glorify you. We thank you for your presence in this place. We thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, for your presence in this place. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for you are in us, moving in us. Hallelujah. We thank you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you that you have not only, hallelujah, saved us from our sin, but you've also empowered us with gifts, hallelujah, the manifestation of gifts and the spirit of God. We thank you that you're in this place, oh God. We thank you, Lord God, not only to move through me, but through everyone here, oh God. Not only through teaching, oh Lord God, but through words of wisdom, knowledge, through words of prophecy, oh God. Use me, oh Lord God. Open my mind. Open my mind. Give me vision. Give me insight. Give me wisdom, oh Lord God. Cause me to see things deep in the spirit. That I wouldn't have been able to see, oh God, on my own accord. Hallelujah, because your word says, what man knows the mind of a man, save the spirit of the man. But what, what man knows the mind of God, save the spirit of God. Holy Spirit, you search the deep things of God to make them known. We glorify you, Lord Jesus, and we bless you. And everybody say, Amen. 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 Praise God. So, we've had um, two lessons so far, and basically, um, in these two lessons, we dealt with um, the beginning of things. For those of you, I think, like not probably 90% of you was um, um, here, uh, or been here for the past two Wednesdays. And so we were dealing with um, the beginning of things, the beginning of man, the beginning of heaven, the beginning of earth, the beginning of the heavens, um, because there are multiple heavens. Um, we're led to believe, based on scripture, there are three um, heavens, um, the one we can see and the two heavens we cannot see. Um, and we know that in the second heaven, this is the realm of the angels or the realm of the spirits. Also, this is a realm where Satan dwells. Um, for your information, Satan is not in hell. Um, he's not in there yet. He will be there, but he's not there. Um, he will soon be there. And also we talked about hell was not designed for human beings. That was not God's original intention. God's purpose for hell and utter darkness was for Satan 
and his um, agents or his demon spirits or his angels. So we have a privilege in Jesus Christ. And for us who are saved, this is not a secret anymore. It was a mystery, but when we became born again, we uncovered that mystery. We uncovered that mystery, and that is part of our kingdom identity. Amen? Right. Just a small recap. Um, I see a lot of new faces here today. So um, I'm sure somebody told you something. Somebody gave you a taste. Somebody told you that you needed to be here tonight. Amen. Somebody told you that you're missing out if you're not here tonight. Somebody told you, girl, if you don't come tonight, I'm sorry for you. <laughs> Amen. So we were talking about discovering our kingdom identity based on scripture. And we know that we were created in the image and the likeness of God. The image of God meaning that we look like God. The likeness of God meaning that we have the character of God or the behavior of God. We act like God. Okay, when God created man, he gave man what he had in him. And when we messed up, he sent Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, who in him dwelled the fullness of the Spirit. So Jesus had both aspects of the Spirit. There are two aspects of the Holy Spirit. There is the character of God, which is the fruits of the Holy Spirit, according to Galatians chapter 5. And it states the fruits of the Holy Spirit, which is the character of God. Because in Romans chapter 14, what does the Bible say? The kingdom of God is not of meat or drink, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the who? In the Holy Spirit. So the kingdom of God is in the Holy Spirit. This is why we cannot do anything apart from the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I will not leave you comfortless, but I will send another unto you. And he will teach you all things. He will speak nothing of himself, but he will only speak what he heard from me. He will only glorify me in everything he do and say. And basically this is the same thing that Jesus said um, when he was on earth to um, the disciples that he does nothing apart from the Father. He only do what he sees the Father doing and he only says what he heard the Father saying or what he heard the Father speaking to him. So we have to understand that without the Holy Spirit, we're nothing. If you don't have a relationship with the Holy Spirit, you need to start now. This is not a message of condemnation. If you don't have one, you need to find one. It's not, it's not our responsibility to beat down on people. As a prophet, I have a responsibility to encourage, edify, sometimes rebuke, but nicely. Put people in check, but nicely. So, the Holy Spirit is here to guide us, to lead us into all truth. Um, we talked about the first aspect of the Holy Spirit, which is the character of God. And the second aspect of the Holy Spirit is the power of God. Paul said, when the Holy Spirit come upon you, he will give you gifts. And in order to manifest those gifts, we, we, we need what? The power of God. You cannot manifest a gift without the power of the Holy Spirit. This is the second aspect of the Holy Spirit. The power of God. Every single one of us here have been given gifts. The Bible said the gifts of and callings of God are without repentance. Meaning that God don't take them away from you. Some people operate in their gifts, even living in sin. Some people do operate in their gifts. 
Because the gifts and the callings of God are without repentance. That doesn't mean you're good with God or you're hearing clearly, but you're still operating. So that, that is the power of the Holy Spirit. And we know there are several gifts um, in which the Holy Spirit operate in, in us. And the reason why we come to church, we're born again. We have the character of the Holy Spirit. But why don't we see the manifestation of the Holy Spirit or the manifestation of gifts as often as we should? Do you believe that we don't have the power at all? Do you believe that it's not necessary to, to do anything? Why do people come in church and leave without receiving the power of the Holy Spirit? This church as we know it is very dominant in um, the prophetic, which is also a superior gift. But why don't we see the other gifts at work? And I know there are many, everybody in this church is not a prophet. We are the, Paul said that we all may prophesy, but we all don't prophesy. And not everybody who prophesies is a prophet. A prophet is, is one of the office, offices of the fivefold gifts of the Holy Spirit or the, the, the fivefold gifting of authority or the fivefold um, ministry of the Holy Spirit. But there are other gifts. There is diverse tongues. There is the interpretation of tongues. There is the word of knowledge, the word of wisdom. There is healing. There is serving. In, in Romans chapter 12, Paul speaks about serving. He also said that if you are a prophet, prophesy. He didn't elaborate. If you are a plumber, you do plumbing. If you are an electrician, you do electrician stuff. If you are a prophet, you prophesy. What other gifts do you have? God is looking for, God is looking for um, hearts that are after Him um, so we could open up to the Holy Spirit so that the Holy Spirit could use us to manifest our gifts. Amen? So this is the second aspect of the Holy Spirit or the second nature of the Holy Spirit. The power of God. And how do you receive that power? You receive that power through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. John the Baptist spoke about it. He said, I baptize you with water unto repentance. But behold, there cometh one after me who's before me. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And in the book of Acts, when we read Acts, we see that happening in chapter 2 of Acts, when the Holy Spirit came down like a mighty rushing wind. And he baptized the disciples and all who were present with them. We led to believe, as scripture state, 120 in the upper room. 50 days after Jesus ascended, which was the Feast of Pentecost. The word Pentecost literally means 50. So we see the Holy Spirit coming in His fullness upon the disciples. And one thing we notice, if we, if we read this and we just follow it carefully, that none of the disciples after the Holy Spirit came in his fullness, including Paul, when he got struck off of his horse on his way to Damascus 
to um, eliminate believers of Christ. He heard a voice. He saw a shining light and the voice spoke to him and said to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he replied, who are you, Lord, that I persecuted him? And, and the voice said to him, it is I, Jesus, whom you persecute. And God gave him instructions. When he got to the place that he needed to be, God told him that wait for a man, he will come unto him, whose name is Ananias, and he shall lay hands on you, and the scales shall be removed. And Paul said, here is water, why should I not be baptized right now? And immediately he was baptized. Paul was completely filled with the Holy Spirit. But for Paul, ministry did not start immediately. The Holy Spirit had to work on Paul. Because Paul had a Christian assassination mentality. And the Holy Spirit worked on him. Amen? Amen. So, last week we dealt with... Um, before the beginning, the beginning of things, and the order and the purpose of things. We talked about the origin of man. We talked about the origin of the earth. We talked about um, the authority of man in Christ or in God. We talked about the glory of God. We talked about um, when Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden. The Bible, the Bible said that God created the earth and he, in it, when he created everything eastward of the garden was Eden and he placed man in there and God gave man his glory and God gave man his honor and we will see that when I go down to the book of Hebrews when um, the writer was talking about um, Jesus and the, um, the superiority of Jesus, who Jesus is, being crowned, being made a little lower than Elohim himself and being crowned with glory and honor. And the Bible referred to Jesus as the second Adam, Adam himself being the first who were also crowned with glory and with honor. And that was Adam's covering. We talked about when Adam ate of the tree of the, 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 the of, of knowledge of, of, of good and evil. God came in the garden, and the Bible said that when Adam heard the voice of Elohim, he ran away and got himself some fig leaves to cover up himself. And God called out to the man, the Bible said. And told the man, where are you? He said that I'm hiding. And, and God said, why are you hiding? He said to God, I am hiding because I am naked. And God did not ask him, what did you do? God did not ask him, what did you do at all? God asked him one simple question, which was very important to God. Who told you that you were naked? I didn't tell you that. There was only one way you could have discovered that. Who told you you were naked? Because when I created you, I clothed you with my glory. I was teaching the youth and I told them that uh, because, you know, young, <laughs> younger kids, they, they, they understand it is not is not as mature as some older believers. So I, I try to express to them that Adam and Eve were not nudist at all. They were crowned with the glory of God. They were uh, clothed with the glory of God. That was their apparel. They were laughing. They thought it was not, um, funny uh, because Adam said that um, the Bible never talked about clothes in the Garden of Eden. Um, and all of a sudden, Adam realizing that he's naked, meaning that he probably had some clothing. But God never talked about giving Adam clothes. He probably did, which was the glory of God. So when that happened, he ran. 
and he hid himself from Elohim. The Bible said that he heard the voice of God and he hid from the presence of God. The Bible referred to the presence of God as having the, the fullness of joy and at his right hand there are pleasures forevermore. And Adam was running away from the fullness of joy and the pleasures forevermore. So God clothed Adam. The first thing God did was clothe Adam. See how much God cared about us even in the midst of our sin? He clothed him. And he told him, who told you? You were naked. And Adam did one thing. We can read it in, in, in Genesis um, chapter 3. Adam did one thing. Genesis chapter 2, um, going towards chapter 3. Adam did one thing. When Adam realized that he was um, sinful or he had messed up and there was no way to um, atone for his sins or um, there was no blood that was shed for his sins because the Bible said that Jesus shed his blood for the remission of our sins. There was no one to atone for Adam. There was no way that Adam could have um, um, gotten right with God. So Adam saw one thing that God placed in the garden was the tree of life. When he saw the tree of life, he ran towards the tree. And God said something while Adam was and Eve were on their way to the tree of life. The Lord said, let us stop them for now they are like us. Knowing the difference between good and evil. So God caused cherubs to protect the tree of life with flaming swords. You know what would happen there? Adam would have eaten of the tree of life. Adam was very smart. He said, you know, I messed up. God will not forgive me. There's a tree of life. If I eat from that tree, I will be fine. I will know good and evil. I will still be sinful men, but I will have eternal life. And God said, not happening on my watch. Because God said, I had a plan, you messed it up, now I have to create a new plan. And with God, nothing is new. Because God already made everything before the foundation of the earth. So there is nothing you could do or say that will surprise God. This is why on Sunday when the Holy Spirit gave me this word from Ephesians chapter 1 about um, God creating us before the foundation of the earth and blessing us with everything. And that doctrine there in Ephesians chapter 1, which is predestination, it's also called the doctrine of election. Meaning that you're saved and you cannot be unsaved. When God calls a thing unto himself, he chooses that thing. We, we don't have the intellect to choose God. God chooses us. Because the disciples asked Jesus a very pivotal question. They told him, um, Rabbi, why do you speak constantly in parables? We barely understand what you say. How do you expect them to understand? He said, only those whom my heavenly father give me will follow me. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. So we know that God existed before everything. Everything was present, but it was out of order, non-visible. That doesn't mean it did not exist yet. So we spoke about everything existing, but it was invisible until God made it visible. Okay, so when God spoke it, it manifested. But um, go with me to the book of Hebrews. Chapter 1. When you dare say amen. If you're not there, say wait. 
Bring your Bibles to church. Bring your Bibles to the church. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. Let's read together. I'm reading from the my favorite version. Everybody have a favorite version. I'm reading from the New King James Version. Okay. God who at various times in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets has in these last days spoken to us by his son whom he has appointed heir of all things remember the bible speak about we being joint heirs together with christ and if Christ is heir of all things and we're joint heirs together with Christ, what does that mean? We have access to all things in Christ, in the spirit. Amen? Amen. Mm -hmm. That is our true identity. Some people live below um, 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 what they... I'm trying to phrase this correctly. Some people live at the, the level of just being born again. Paul said, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Not as if you were going to lose your salvation, but literally what it is saying there is that when you become born again, the work just began. When you become born again, there is still a lot more work to do in you and on the earth. There is still a lot of character changing in you. And there is still a lot of manifestation of the works of the Holy Spirit through you on earth. So born again is one aspect of the believer. Let's continue reading. Who being the brightness of his glory... And the expression, the express image of his person. Pay careful attention to um, the description of Jesus Christ here. And upholding all things, it keeps, it just keeps on repeating all things. Upholding all things by the word of his power. When he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels. As he, now we know so much better, meaning that he received a seat or throne higher than the angels. They're not his companions, but they're, they're his servants. As he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than the angels for to which of the angels did he ever say you are my son today i have begotten you and again i will be to him a father and he will be to me a son but when he again bring the firstborn into the world he says let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he says, who makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. But to the son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. So we see that Jesus has a kingdom. And he rules with a scepter of righteousness. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. And you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundations of the earth. So this scripture is actually putting Jesus in the beginning of things. Or including Jesus in the creation of all things. It says there, you Lord in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth. 
and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain, and they will all grow old like a garment, like a cloak. You will fold them up, and they will be changed, but you are the same, and your years will not fail. But to which one of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister to those who will inherit salvation? Amen? Amen. So we see the supremacy of Christ in this scripture. And this is just only one portion of scripture that exalts Christ to the place of um, um, King of Kings and Lord of Lords seated at the right hand of God the Father, making the angels his servants and not his companions. Also in Colossians chapter 1, it speaks of Jesus' supremacy, um, saying that Jesus is the very manifestation of God or the very image of God. So when we, when we went through this, there were a lot of things that just blow out to us, that just popped out of the scripture. Not only it's speaking about Jesus' supremacy and his inheritance and his kingdom, but also if we are joined as together with Christ, that means that we don't only have access to this. It's like you, it's like you owning a pantry in your house. And you have kids in the house. All your kids have access to the pantry. They don't have to ask you, Mommy, can I take this? Unless you tell them, don't take anything without asking me. But the kids know by right as your children that they have access to the refrigerator, they have access to the pantry. They could eat whatever is there because you went out and you worked and made sure that they have everything they need. This is what Jesus did on our behalf. When the angel visited Mary, and told Mary that you will be with child. And Mary said, how can this be? I am but a virgin. I've never been with a man. The angel said, don't worry. After the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you shall, be, um, you shall conceive and bring forth a son. And you shall name him Yeshua. And the, hope, the, the angel told Mary who Jesus will be even before Jesus was born. And Jesus is rank before Jesus was even born. Naming Jesus king and the government of this world being on his shoulder. Came to set his people free. He originally went to the house of Israel, but when he was rejected, he prepared for himself a bride. And we, Paul said, we have been engrafted to the branch or to the tree, meaning that we are um, being saved as Gentiles, being grafted to the tree, the original branch. God prepared for himself a bride. And if, um, for all those who are married here, and we know, all know about marriage, how relationship works. When someone is married, both parties have equal access to anything, bank account, anything. Anything that belongs to one person belongs to the other, equally. Some people don't, not everybody believe in that way. Some people sign um, 
what's it called, a prenuptial agreement. I call that the selfish agreement. Because if you are in Christ and you have purpose in Christ, I don't want to offend anybody, especially those who are watching live on Facebook. I don't want to offend anybody, but I'm just saying that for those of us who are in Christ Jesus, I'm referring to those of us who are in Christ and we are married in Christ with the perspective of Christ in our relationship. That we don't go into a relationship thinking selfishly. We go into the relationship knowing that what, what is mine is hers and what is hers is mine. Shared bank account. Shared bank account. That's the intention. And the Bible never said, um, for this day a man shall leave his, his uh, um, um, mother and father and cleave unto his servant. Your wife is not your servant, you are not your wife's supervisor. Some men behave like supervisors. Why don't you, do, why don't you ask me before doing this? Why don't you? If you're in a relationship, there's supposed to be a mutual agreement. We call the bride of Christ for a reason. There is a mutual agreement. When we come to that understanding of that mutual agreement, that place, because if you realize what Jesus um, has been doing is trying to frame our mind to a place where we become unselfish in renewing our identity in Christ. The regeneration process is when one one thing who were uh, uh, who, who one thing who was at one time um, um great um fell away and Jesus saying I want to make it great again. That is the purpose of regeneration. I was speaking to a friend of mine and I told her that when Jesus was on the cross, he said one, one of the most important things that could have ever, um, um, uh, that, that, uh, one of the most important statements that could, he could have ever made on that cross, he said it is finished. Meaning that all the work is done. Everything is done. He went to hell, he went to um, Sheol, and he took the keys of death and Hades. In the Garden of Eden, death was present as a spirit, but death had no power. God created death because God told Adam, the day you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall surely what? You shall introduce death or give death power. But Adam himself did not die. He was still in operation. But what he did, he activated death and gave death power to act. That's why um, the Bible says that um, um, to live is Christ and to die is gain. When we are in Christ, we are we are we we deactivate death in Christ Jesus. Death has been swallowed up. That's why <laughs> I was listening to Dr. Miles Monroe, and, he, and uh, he was talking about things that Satan does not want you to know. The Bible says that death has no power over you whatsoever. You sh what? That's the least of your worries. That should, death should be the least of your worries because it has no power over you whatsoever. Because of the Spirit of God that lives in you, that have come to revive you. Not only your spirit, but also to give you the boldness of God. 
One of the first things that happened when the Spirit came down um, upon Peter, the Bible said in, in um, uh, Acts chapter 2 that he quoted from Joel chapter 2 about um, this was what um, the Bible spoke about or the, 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 the word spoke about that in the last days that the Spirit of God will fall upon all flesh. But the Bible said that he rose up in boldness. One of the first things that the Holy Spirit gave him was boldness. Because he struggled with that timidity. But as soon as the Holy Spirit came, it resurrected him. Things that he, he never knew that was inside of him came alive. And not one time Peter struggled with his identity or who he was. Not because he was one of the disciples or he was with Jesus from the beginning to end. But when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, things change. When the Holy Spirit manifests itself in you, things change. You will never be the same again. I have two minutes to wrap this up and I just want to make this statement here today that our identity is in Christ Jesus. Right. Our identity is hidden in Christ and the person who brings out our identity is who? The Holy Spirit. But why do so many people still struggle in the areas of their identity? We're not yielded, right? If you know, if you buy a, a vehicle and you know that your vehicle either use diesel or unleaded, leaded, and you know without that fuel in there that the vehicle doesn't move. But you still try to put the key in and try to move it. And it's, it, it, it doesn't move it as a, it, it's at a standstill. The Holy Spirit is like the fuel. The Holy Spirit is like the gas that moves us. Without gas, your car can't go anywhere. You could have oil in there. You could have coolant in there. You could have everything else but gas. The vehicle still won't go and you will try to start it and start it but it just won't start as it should the Holy Jesus said I give you another comforter some people place more emphasis on Jesus and they place little to no emphasis on the Holy Spirit whatsoever and Jesus said it's more profitable for you that I leave because the one who is coming after me will teach you all things. There is nothing hidden from us as kingdom people. There is nothing hidden from us as children of God because the Holy Spirit's responsibility and that is a command from Jesus that is a promise from Jesus Jesus said when he comes he will teach you all things and he also called the Holy Spirit the spirit of promise that statement means that the Holy Spirit's mandate is to make sure that every promise of God is fulfilled and the way we see the fulfillment or the manifestation of God's promises is by being yielded to the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Let's stand tonight. Praise God. I hope you were empowered tonight or you learned a little something that you may um, not have known before. Um, last class, we had a wonderful time. After teaching, we asked everybody to come up front and we were prophesying and speaking words over them. 
I'm a prophet, so that's what you get. So I have nothing else. All I could do is prophesy. God help me. Amen? Amen. So we'll do the same exercise for like five minutes, if that's okay, with the elders. I would like the pastors and the elders to come up front. And oh, we'll just ask everybody to come up front.